Welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show, your one-stop shop for weird news, spooky, otherworldly, and paranormal shenanigans. We'll take a dive into what's going on in creepy pop culture. You can follow us on Twitter at creepin' underscore it, and like us on Facebook at The Creepin' It Real Show. Do you have a paranormal story you'd like to share with us? You can email us at creepinitrealshow at gmail.com. So, Moni, Yardley, uh, you know what's really fun to do um, for a hobby is to have a horror podcast where you choose a plane crash to um, investigate the day you get on a plane. Well, since I'm two days out from being on a plane my own self and is not my favorite mode of transportation, right? yes, I very much appreciate your choice here this week. It was not planned, but... Yardley? Yeah. yeah I, was, I was listening in. Whatever. Mm-hmm. At least the YouTube video that you had us watch, the documentary, was not the most depressing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. At least that was true. So, really? Because, yeah. God damn, oh I think God. I cried like three times watching it's that thing. It's so bad. <gasps> like, it is. I mean, this was going to be a rough topic anyway, but yeah. you chose like the documentary that was mostly focused on the victim's families and oh my God, he yeah. did. So yeah. I wanted to, um, well, before we get into that, first of all, uh, welcome to Grooving Oil Show. Um, we're going to talk about Lockerbie, Scotland, the 1988 plane crash. Um, you know, last month it was the 30 year anniversary and I read this huge expose about it and totally forgot about it. Um, it was the worst terrorist attack before 9-11, and um, I think what got me through 9-11, I sat down and there was a blog dedicated to how all these Canadian people helped these people that were stuck there because air tra- uh, all, all the airplanes that had been going overseas were diverted there when it happened, And they were stuck there for over a week. And these towns got together and literally spent everything they gave, everything they had, and gave up their time and everything to help these people. And I became addicted to that because I needed it. I needed to see, like, the piece of humanity there that could get me through what was going on at the other end. And so I read an expose about the citizens of Lockerbie. And you don't really hear a lot. I mean, of course... The tragedy is what you hear about, but I think, like, what the citizens went through was huge and important, and we, of course, remember the victims, and we will definitely talk about them, but I also wanted to cover the the citizens that live there, and even the ones that died, 11 died, so that's what we're going to cover today, and let me just tell you, it is very sad. I, man, I just reading trying to make notes I was crying it's devastating to listen to and what these people went through and the the victims so uh put your big girl pants and big boy pants on because it's gonna be a little bit rougher than what we normally talk about because these are really heartfelt quotes and stories so yeah um, murder mutilations you know that's is bad kind of Totally deep, (laughs) totally deep. But for some reason, reading these stories was like tore me apart. Literally, like mutilations. I'm just kidding, but it was sad, and I I was crying. I know about Yardley, but I'm looking forward to this now. Now, when you really sold it to me, yeah. And then, like the story, which we'll get into, where the kid who lost his whole family, you know, pulls out the watering can out of his trunk. He's like, "This is all I have left of my family," because that's everything burned to the ground, you know. And it was just like, how devastating is that? I can't even imagine. But um, anyway, yeah. before that, we'll get into some weird, funny, hopefully a little bit of good news, um, crazy news, because people still are fucked up in the world as well. Uh, so, Yardley, uh, you got a cat story, sweet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there, there wasn't a ton of stuff on the weird yeah. news front, but I did see a story that I thought was kind of funny and it shows the love that people have for their animals um a silicon valley dad who was unable to house his daughter's cats decided there was really only one thing to do 
and that was to get the cats their own apartment. Um, the cats' names are Louise and Tina, and they've been living in a $1,500 a month studio apartment, complete with Apple Shit. TV, yeah, out in San Jose. Um, the apartment also is furnished with couches and a cat tree. Um, Troy Good pays the rent, which is apparently a good deal considering that some of the apartments uh, and houses in that neighborhood run for about 2000 a month. So <laughs> the cats belong to his daughter, Victoria. Uh, she was unable to take them to her school dorm at Azusa Pacific University outside of L.A. when she became a freshman. So Good told the Mercury News he couldn't keep the cats either because they didn't get along with his girlfriend's dog. So, <laughs> so we asked a friend if the cats could stay in his apartment, and they worked out a deal. So apparently the cats are doing well, and as part of the deal, he pretty much gets a $500 discount on oh, renting God. that place. But what I have to ask all of you, <laughs> like, you know, when I'm reading this thing and I'm saying, um, and I'm seeing that he was saying, well, you know, we can't keep it here because it doesn't get along with the dog, you got to work some shit out. Like $1,500 yeah. a month is a grip yeah. for, you know, we know it. You know, animals, they're going to chill. And, you know, your, your cats are always going to chill uh, for the most part wherever they're at. But for me, if I'm paying $1,500 a month, that motherfucking cat has to understand that I'm paying $1,500 a month. And they don't. <laughs> they're just, you know, they're just chilling. But that's a lot of money. So would either of you be willing to even pay half of that a month uh, so that your dog and cat could have a place to say Listen, pets are family. I'm all for like pet parents and like my fur babies are my first kids, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, my flesh and blood human kids are lucky that I pay what I pay for my mortgage so that they can survive in the same household as me. There's no motherfucking way I'm going to give a cat or cats some apartment because they can't get along with uh, with dogs you can find a good home for you know I, i'll pay someone fifteen hundred dollars one time for to give them a good home how about that yeah i mean or, or couldn't you do something to maybe keep them separate yeah. in the house like how I about just a don't... garage or something She's I, California. $1, you could get a nice crate Hell, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what person's girlfriend is going to be cool with their dude dropping fifteen hundred dollars a month on, 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 not where my mistress lives with my cats not at all i mean i just you know that's just kind of weird but i, I thought that that was a Funny story. I definitely believe that it can go in the weird news thing, but uh, yeah. I don't know, Christy. Would you uh, would you shell out that bag? Hell no. If you you haven't met my cat, she's fucking crazy. Like the she's just lucky she has a roof over her head. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be paying sixteen hundred dollars a month for her her own place, her own pad. No, no, fuck no. Sorry. She's... Yeah, it just seems like there has to be. <laughs> It just seems like there would have to be an answer for that that didn't require it. But at the same time, the article doesn't say what um, what Troy Good does for a living. Maybe. Yeah. You know, well, obviously. he lives in Silicon Valley. Well, clearly. So yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. He's got bread for it. But I just think probably the average person would just listen and just be like, wow, like, that that's still, even if I had the bread, I don't know if I could do it, though. I have to find another arrangement because that's just money. That's money that could be going in the pocket of your kids or into a savings account or, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. No, I get it. I, I mean, that's how the other half live, apparently. I got a text from my sister-in-law who is well off, and she's like, we're all going to the Caymans for Easter. And she's like, I found airfare the same price as, as I we paid, and it's 18 like almost $1,900 a person. I'm like, <laughs> uh... Okay, <laughs> no, because no. we got bills to pay, damn it. We're not just going to drop, you know, what is that's almost but, eight grand on even us. No, we're certainly not going to do it for fucking cats. Well, <laughs> well, and also, <laughs> you have to wonder, like, what kind of planning went into this. You mean to tell me, like, you, you knew that your daughter was going to college. Like, you see all of this stuff coming. How do you, you know what I mean? How do you not? find an arrangement where she could have her pets with her. I mean, I... He's definitely putting a mistress up there. He's got his girlfriend at home, <laughs> and he's like, my cat, a.k.a. the other pussy, doesn't get along oh with my, my main God. pussy, so I gotta, like, house it somewhere else so I can go visit because the cats have to be fed, don't Brilliant. they? Brilliant. Brilliant. Gotta cat keep that pussy sitter. happy. 
the cat sitter. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I don't mean to take the reins from you, Christy, but I do have to. I want to. I do want to segue <laughs> and ask a uh, moment. Uh, no, no, by oh. all means, take the hit. <laughs> all, of the, all of these semen weird. <laughs> First of all, Yardley, you you started it with whatever the hell it was. The the thing you posted wasn't that you that posted that was the. Me. Oh, that was you too. Oh, that never mind. You're me. off the hook, Yardley. Okay. I'm like, thanks for starting it off. Yardley posted the the shake nah. semen, but nope, here the you are. The semen is all me, all, let me tell you. Okay, that's what um, she said. So, yeah, exactly. So, shout out to my buddy. We were actually at work because many much professional. We were working on a presentation for the board today, and he's, like, scrolling through his social media and was like, this is a story I need to send you to be on the podcast. So, congratulations, bro. You made it. <laughs> um <laughs> This is a guy who, he went to the doctor, but not for his arm, which you'll find out why his arm is in pain in a second. He had a severe, sudden onset of lower back pain from having lifted a heavy steel object. So he goes to the doctor for a checkup, but the doctor finds a patch of red swelling in his right forearm, after which the man admitted that he'd been injecting himself with his own semen using a hypodermic needle that he had purchased on the internet. Uh, <laughs> Why? That's, the, that's the question it's almost like where did he get the information that that would work or did someone tell him and how that could you fucking internet man yeah. so he injected three doses and he because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing with that oh. hypodermic needle oh. he had ended ended up um injecting himself in the blood vessels and the muscles you're not supposed to do that there was air in there and um there's a picture just of the arm being all swollen because mm -hmm. there's no way for your body to like absorb that or spread it anywhere and get rid of it so yeah they ended up making a case study out of this guy um seemingly harmless back mm. pain an unusual presentation of a subcutaneous subcutaneous mm -hmm. abscess so basically, so the, they made a, a medical dose? article out of this dipshit. What's the dose? What like a a full syringe or like a full of his emission? Like a whole? I don't know. Like what is a That's dose? That's a question. <laughs> Who I mean, prescribed the dose? Like what is the dose? There's a spoiler also. Like if your body ejects something from it, that's yeah, you know something that was in. made to come out. Maybe you don't put it back in. You know that goes for poop. That goes for any kind of other bodily fluids. Uh, your body's getting rid of that for a reason. Let it go. So let it there you go. go. There's that. Let it go. And then I have a that dishonorable is, mention for wait, a similar it's, it's, article. Hold wait, on, Moni. Is putting poop back in your ass like something? People, like, okay, there's this whole, like, normalized menstruation type of movement that these women, like, make art out of their own period blood. Yeah, I and I can't that. even hardly say that without Impact. gagging because that, that came. People do stuff with their poop. People do stuff. They like make art with it. They finger paint. Like you know, I've it's, seen that, but I just didn't know that putting poop back in your ass was a thing. No, no, no. Just in general, okay. utilizing any kind of bodily fluid or waste for other means is not a good idea. That's the True medical that. advice that I'm giving right now. <laughs> Doctor Moni, here she is. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know Special. what? I've got to be more qualified than whatever information this guy got. <laughs> I'm dying to know. Like, please reveal where you got this from. Why? 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 I don't know. Why? I'll have to ask my buddy where um, where he got it from because, yeah, he was just scrolling through. So well, the same thing with this, this vegan mom thing that I'm going to share. I was just scrolling oh, through boy. social media. Oh, Bizarre States. Somebody had posted it to the Bizarre States group. Um, it's actually an old story, but, yeah, that's where I found that. So it's probably one of those weird groups, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> well no, your next one's a good one too. I actually had read about that before you posted. I, oh, yeah, it, I see it advertising. Also, advertising the KFC gravy scented candle. Didn't we talk about that? <laughs> like, I remember that. It's like the advertisement on this on this link. I'm laughing my ass off. Go well, for it. I feel like the kind of people that thinks this is a good idea are probably in line with that. Mm -hmm. Um. 
So, okay. So this was actually not a news story. I don't know why it made the rounds again today or this week, but it did. Um, and this woman's fairly hot. So also I noticed that the the uh, title for the article, they had to say, vegan single mom, not just a mom. She's single, y'all. If, you, if you're interested after you hear this, drink sperm smoothies, but not from the source, okay? So it's not as exciting as you think. Uh, every morning to give her energy. Also, spoilers, that is not vegan. If it's made by an animal, which a human is an animal, that's not considered vegan. Yeah, dipshit. So uh, the woman is super hot, and she has a, a guy friend, what is it, three times a week, bring her sperm so that she could make it into a smoothie. And it gets weirder and weirder because I start to like gag as she's as she's talking about it. like I don't like it when he eats asparagus because she's yeah she's, she's like, drinking cold nut. Hey, listen. So <laughs> like, why the fuck? I'm just saying. Oh, her gross. Her don't you, what does yoga say? Live active cultures? Isn't that, I'm, if, I, if oh. her French has been like, don't you want this fresh? Like, what? Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm like, you know, get it from the source, girl. Like, you you single, you hot, you get it. But no, she's she's having to bring her bring her batches. And at first he was a little hesitant. That's so gross. Um, but I'm, then, you know, I am, she convinced okay, I'm gagging right now. Oh, God. I okay. Know. <laughs> okay. Every batch tastes different depending on what he's been eating. Oh, God. Okay. If he's been drinking alcohol or having asparagus, I ask him to give me a heads up so oh I know not God. to drink it straight up. Listen, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> oh, God. Asparagus. No, because it's funny. Everybody knows asparagus stinks when you pee. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, does it yep. stink with that, too? And I, <laughs> I didn't that's know the, that. That's the urban legend, right? You have to have, like, pineapple juice. Pineapple. To drink it tastes or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Asparagus changes. The oh my gosh, this is, this is like a well, weird. Well, the funny thing, thing, thing about it was before you had posted it, I had previously, um, you know, read about the story. I'm pretty sure um, that you probably checked out the comment section because that oh I must have stayed up for like 15 minutes just reading comments, and they went from, of course, what the fuck to. Well, even if she was going to do it, she didn't have to, you know, post about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah were like defending her but most of the people were outraged but you actually had people who seemed like that they would be with it they just wouldn't have put it out there oh she is the gift that keeps on giving and i've heard about this although yeah i've heard about this not even being straight from the source but like secondhand like this women using it for facials yeah. Um, and that's what she says is I it makes a that. brilliant facial. Okay. However, um, she also, let's see, the guy had qualms about it because she probably had to sign like a, some kind of waiver because he was like, how do I know you're not going to impregnate yourself? Which is a valid question, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So she's keen to find a partner who will take over from him. So if she, it, well, guess what guys, she's willing to take it straight from the source if she finds the right partner. So she's hot, you know, line up for that and you'll have a really good time. Cool. I want a relationship cool. where my partner asks if I want one or two shots of sperm in my smoothie each morning. Hey, I just want to apologize to the listeners because I know my headphones keep hitting the mic because I keep trying to go on mute to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's coming through, that is not the engineering side. That's oh all me. Oh, my God. Wow. Ah, it's you. Yeah, so there you go. It's a, she's, she's a piece of work, and uh -huh. that's not vegan. And, you know, if you want it warm no. and fresh, that's your business. But this is, this is a step over the line. Okay, so. now, vegan people won't drink milk, but they'll drink kids. That's what I'm saying. And they won't eat eggs that are going to come out of a yeah. chicken anyway. And yeah, that's fine. You but have no, eggs, we're going to drink vegan, guys. possible children. Like, I'm yeah. going to drink, like, what? Baby. How do you feel about that? <laughs> my head is exploding right now. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, well, I don't even know how to follow that. Uh, <laughs> you know. Mine is just an update on um, a movie. I'm kind of excited about, excited I'm, about it. I'm being yeah. cautiously optimistic about this. Um, Gremlins 3 script is finished, and this reboot will be as twisted and dark as anything. Now, as anything, what is as anything? I don't know what that means, but again, I'm being optimistic about it. 
Um, it says it will be uh, over Christmas again, but the Gremlins are coming back and their new shenanigans will be the product of their original creator, Chris Columbus. He tells them he's finished the script for Gremlins 3 and indicates we'll be looking at an even grittier Gremlins this time. Nice. Columbus says he's proud of what he's got and it's twisted and dark as anything, so we'll see. Even Who more in the last name Columbus names her kid Chris. Like, I no know, disrespect right? to this dude, but I'm like, is it the Columbus no. who sailed in 1492? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, and they're <laughs> like, why not? Hey, he's following the greats, right? Or as they say, but um, even more encouraging, he says, is he wanted to go back to the really twisted sensibility of the first movie, which, let's face it, is part of why the original 1984 hit was so much fun. Which, Yardley, you had already brought this up a little bit, right? We talked about it, because I didn't know if this was coming out, and then we talked about Gremlins 2, and we were trying to figure out if it was over Christmas 2, and now this one's going to be over Christmas. So Yeah. Yeah, I think we... I don't know, was it like in October or something? Yeah, yeah, just a couple like, of shows ago, yeah. Yeah, you know, so I, you know what, I'm I'm excited. I, I'm I'm hoping that they continue with similar themes from the um from the earlier film. I know that there are some people who say they don't like Gremlins too. I, I like Gremlins too. I don't think it's better than the first one, but uh, uh, there was lots of stuff to enjoy. I just I'm wondering. Well, I'm more excited because I know that they're going to be able to use, you know, real puppets, but at the same time, right. they'll be able to enhance them with yes. CGI. Yeah. So that was the I thing. Is, he said yeah. limited C CGI, which I think will really uh, make this good. Yeah. It won't be so... Because gremlins are hard to create on a computer. I mean, you, you got to have the puppets, but I feel you yeah, well, better. Well, no, you really don't. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how good people are now with, yeah. with that stuff. However, if you wanted to have a certain feel, because, like, when something gets CGI enhanced, I think you have to have that because you're going to be able to pull off better facial expressions than you could get with a prosthetic, right. you know, certain eye movements. And, of course, there are going to be certain things that they're going to have to do that's not going to look as cool with a puppet. Mm -hmm. But I do like that they're embracing the old technique and just kind of, you know, strengthening it up with some CGI. But I don't know. When they say dark and twisted, I, I don't know. Because wasn't the first Gremlins, it was PG, right? I think so, but it was no, also, I it have scared never me. Seen it. The real, the I've original never one? You've never Wait, seen Gremlins? Never seen it. Hold on Because now. it came uh, out when I was pretty little, oh and I thought that, my huh? I don't even know how that's possible. That's <laughs> insane. You have to watch it. I thought it. that they lived under my bed, and so my parents were like, this is too scary for you, and then I just never got around to it after oh I grew up. Oh, my gosh. Up. Okay, so, you have on, to do isn't it. Isn't it on Netflix? Is, I, I could have sworn it. Could be. Wasn't it on Netflix at some point? I kind of felt or, like it was one of those where I got the point, like I know what happens, yeah, you know, and so I just didn't uh, bother to watch it. Oh, yeah, just try you have to. Or um, Netflix, I, I could have sworn. That I saw it on one of those. I th I think you'll I think you'll like it. I, I can guarantee you this: it won't be the worst thing that you've seen. No, that's true. I've seen uh, Jeepers Creepers three, so um, <laughs> yeah, it is PG thirteen, by the way. So. <laughs> uh, I think you definitely got to check it out because it's uh, it's a classic for sure. I mean, it goes down there to me with the Night of the Living Dead and all those others. Like it's it's well, good. Well, let me ask you all this. Let me ask. Well, let me ask you this, Christy. Do you think that because you know how some movies come out in a certain decade, mm -hmm. and in that decade, for what was going on in that decade, some movies work, but they're kind of frozen, like in that era where they, they would only work, you know, back then. So, like, if you watch them now, and then you've got some movies that kind of, you know, that are relatable or hold up through any era, do you think that the way that Gremlins was? the first one in the 80s, that if they kind of keep that core of what they were doing back then today, do you think that that would work? Or do you think that they're going to just keep some of the, um, would it be better to keep some of the um, original imagery, you know, the things that we yeah. love, of course, the gremlins and the mogwai. Actually, do you think the mogwai would be in it? Did it say anything about, like... Oh, they have to be. Well, at least Gizmo. I mean, Gizmo's got to be in it. That's It's not Gremlins without Gizmo, for sure. Oh, cute. But, but do you think that, that, that the Gremlins would hold up in, like, 2020? You know what I'm saying? That was a long time ago. That was, like, what, 30-something years ago? Yeah. Um. You know what? 
if Ghostbusters and all these other movies from the 80s hadn't come back and made made a pretty good impact and hits, I, I would have said no. But I think there's room for, for these to be redone. They're really good movies. I think they can last. I just do. I, I really think it, it will work out. I'm being optimistic about it. Some of them I'm not. Some of them I roll my eyes about. But this one... I, oh, yeah. when we know it's from the original writer, I, it makes me happy. I'm like, okay, you know what? If anybody's going to do it, if this can succeed, it's him. So it's proper. I'm, it's near and dear to yes. a lot of people. So I have even my ugly Christmas sweater. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Oh, you perfect. Know what I mean? yeah. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. It's, I, I loved, I loved that movie. Again, it was one of those steps I took into the love of horror that I is my twisted sick mind today, so I, I definitely have a place in my heart for it. Um, I just remember being a kid and like standing at the bus stop, and we must have talked about that movie for months. I mean, it that one and ET were like huge for us, so I can see it happening, and I can see all of us, you know, that being and that being such a special place in our heart, I can see us making that work. Of course, our generation is small, but we be mighty. So let's see what let's see if it'll work out. But I'm again, I'm being cautiously optimistic about it. So, are we ready for the most depressing conversation ever? <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's crash get her this done. whole podcast like a, yes. like a locker B plane. That's right. We're about to throw all kinds of cold water on your boner. So anyway, um, <laughs> on your on your your semen smoothie. I was gonna um, say, at least you're not drinking the proceeds <laughs> from that boner, so it's all good. Uh, so tonight we're going to cover the 1988 bonding, bonding, bombing. Of, my lips are numb right now. So. I'm having a hard time talking. The 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. I assigned homework to Moni and Yardley. It was a um, a YouTube video of a documentary New that... JFK Airport. Sorry, it's playing. We don't want that. Um, called the Lockerbie, Lockerbie bombing. And like we had talked about previously, it was pretty intense. Um, Yardley, what did you think? Did you remember this bombing, or was this at all any kind of like impact in you at all growing up? Yeah, you, you you dropped out. There was oh, a long shit. space. I Sorry. couldn't hear anything. Did you, A, what did you think of the documentary if you watched it, and B, did you remember this? Did this at all, like... Do you have any memories of what when this happened back in 1988? Yeah, you know what? I, I do. Well, first and foremost, the documentary was actually pretty great. I almost mm -hmm. wish that you would have pulled some clips from it um, to add to the show. Right. But, yeah, because one of the things that the documentary did was what I don't think that a lot of the coverage did was it also focused on the people who were on the ground, whose houses were destroyed. Yes. And kind of listening to some of the firsthand accounts of some of the people talking about those situations, it's just... And th and they also kind of brought to light a lot of different things that I, I don't think that a lot of the public thinks about that people on the ground have to go through mm -hmm. after an accident like this. But I have to say, because usually, you know, I, I have to hold my nose sometimes to get mm -hmm. through some documentaries. I actually sat and watched this whole thing just mainly because hearing those firsthand accounts, uh, you know, it's something that kind of gets you. Yeah. Um, Moni, the lady, you know, what really got me watching that, that documentary was the lady like laying down in the airport, floor oh, screaming yeah. that's right my baby that. my that was, baby yeah. yeah i was just like oh my god i mean if you want to watch a documentary about this whole thing this this one was excellent and it really hit you hit you in the stomach at the beginning straight on yeah. right from the start um this woman you know goes to the airport to pick up her child um who had been in london for uh, school and of course doesn't make it home and she just lost her shit and it is just absolutely heartbreaking to listen to. So the yeah. reason I complained about the documentary is um, they did a great job for their focus and their focus being kind of the aftermath and, um, you know, the impact on the families in the town. And that was great. But 
you know me with crime and all that is I felt like the end just, you know, didn't go as much in depth as I was curious about, about, you know, the who done it and the why. Yeah, so true. I'm excited to um, do this podcast tonight and talk about that more. Cause I started right. Googling that a little bit. and was just reading up on like who they thought did it and who got exonerated and who went to prison, but got let out. Like there was a lot of back and forth that was interesting in that respect. And um, took for me, a little bit of some of the just flat out sadness over what had happened, you know, a way to right. kind of get my mind thinking about the crime aspect. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing that's kind of tragic about this is just the fact that this is another case of saying at some point, everything you do is going to be the last time you do it. And yeah. you just never know. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's, it's really sad when, you know, those people didn't really, you know, they didn't deserve it. Absolutely. I agree. Um, I don't know when this um, documentary aired. I think it was in, like, 2013. Um, so it was rather new um, when it came out. And, no, they didn't cover a lot of the crime. But there is one that I'm watching now called My Brother's Bomber. And I think I mentioned it when I talked about this is what I was going to talk about tonight. Um, it is a – it's several, like – episodes um i think or maybe yeah there's several episodes of this guy his brother died on the bombing and he grew up to be a filmmaker and he does this series about who went to jail for it why um one of them got released because he was dying of cancer he goes over there undercover and starts asking questions probably shouldn't be asking these questions and really does like risk a lot to uncover um what what happened what really happened because he knows just like a lot of people know that the one person that went for, to jail for this did not do this all alone i mean there Correct. was clearly yeah. clearly a huge amount of people involved including probably the government and yes yeah. um so he he really for his own soul needed needed answers and so if you're interested after you know listening to this you want to hear more and you want to get more in depth um, check out My Brother's Bomber. I'm still watching it, so I don't know how it ends, but um, it's it's very interesting. He is, he's like a dog with a bone on that thing. I mean, he's not letting it go, and he has dived into very, very risky Dangerous. situations yeah. um, to find the answers he needs. So you definitely want to check that out. Um, but without further ado, I will say um, I got my sources are a lot. I read a ton of material one in particular was a um, expose on BBC. They did a big article about the crash on the 30-year anniversary, and I thought they did such a great job covering what exactly what I was looking for, which was the town people. I mean, that was really what I was going after. Um, at the end of the day, this is a horrible tragedy, and I know it's horrible, and I know all these people died, and I know that horrible people did it uh, but I think a lot of the like you said Yardley the citizens and highlighting them was kind of skated over and so now 30 years later a lot of those stories are coming out and I just kind of wanted to highlight that in our show and then hopefully open up everybody's curiosity to check out everything else so yeah okay so with that, uh, how the Lockerbie disaster haunts Scotland 30 years on. Wow, we really are old. 30 years it's been. Um, on December 21st, 1988, Pan American Flight 103 flying from London Heathrow to JFK Airport in New York exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing a total of 2,000, 270 people, including 11 people on the ground. Out of the 259 people on the Pan American plane, about 170 were Americans, and many of those were university students returning from for the Christmas holidays. The flight never made it back to the U.S. Just 35 minutes after takeoff, Pan Am Flight 103 took off from Heathrow Airport and headed almost directly north. After crossing the border with Scotland, the pilot guided the plane slightly to the west. It was due to head out over the Atlantic, bound for New York's John F. Kennedy Airport. But shortly after 7 p.m., PA-103 disappeared from radar screens. Multiple signals were seen fanning out and downwards from its last radar position like fireworks on the screen. 
There was no distress, distress call. Afterwards, there was radio silence. There was a bomb in the forward hold. It was hidden inside a radio cassette recorder, which was in a suitcase. Within 40 seconds of its midair detonation, the remains of the plane rained down on the town of Lockerbie. Following a three-year investigation, murder warrants were issued in November 1991 for two Libyans. The explosion on Pan Am Flight 103 ripped the aircraft apart and the debris plummeted on the roofs of the quiet Scotland town. The disaster took place about 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, about 9 o'clock in the United States. It was not clear in the first day or so what had happened was a bombing, only that the plane had somehow broken up in the air and everyone on board had been killed. Stories of the citizens of Lockerbie. Marjorie, Marjorie McQueen was in the living room of her home, home in Lockerbie watching television with her teenage daughter, Victoria. It was the shortest day of the year, and there were just four more days until Christmas. For the McQueen family, like millions of others in the UK, the must-see midweek show was This Is Your Life. Children's entertainer Harry Corbett and the, was the celebrity being surprised by presenter Michael Aspel, who was dressed as Sooty, one of Corbett's glove puppet creations. As the program got into its rhythm, Marjorie became unsettled by a noise. I think I hear thunder, she said to 14-year-old Victoria. But instead of rumbling away, the thunder kept getting louder. Oh, I wonder if the boiler is about to explode, the 42-year-old thought. Marjorie, whose, whose doctor husband was out with friends, was so baffled by the sound, she ventured into the cold, wintry night. She recalls, when I went outside, I was aware of something just past the house. And then within five seconds, there was an enormous, it wasn't an explosion. I would never even call it an explosion. It was a crump. <laughs> that was all I heard. And then there was a whoosh and suddenly the whole sky turned orange and there were flames hundreds of feet up into the air. I had no idea what had happened. A few yards away from her home and in the small town in the southwest in southwest Scotland, a scene of unimaginable devastation was unfolding. Canon Patrick Keegan's had recently been appointed parish priest and was looking forward to spending his first Christmas in Lockerbie, where he lived at one Sherwood Crescent. The clergyman had made new friends in the street, and that evening he was due to meet up with two of them, Dora and Maurice Henry. He planned to take his visiting mother to the Henrys after watching the evening news on television. Before they left, he went upstairs to make sure that he had hidden his mother's Christmas present. Suddenly, he heard what he thought was a military plane overhead. Downstairs, before they left, he went upstairs to make sure he had hidden his mother's Christmas present. Suddenly, he heard what he thought was a military plane overhead. To F.R. Keegan's, it sounded like it was going to crash into a nearby field. Immediately after that, there was an enormous explosion, he says. The shaking stopped, and to his surprise, he was uninjured. Downstairs, F.R. Keegan's found his mother safe, having been shielded from the blast by a fridge freezer. The pair stumbled out of the house into a scene of destruction. Sherwood Crescent was on fire, and the most of the houses were destroyed. The bodies of the Henrys were never found. They were among 11 residents of Sherwood Crescent who died that night. So the people they were supposed to go have dinner with were never found. How insane is that? By yeah. just minutes. Just minutes they well, lived. Well, the other thing is when, when you were watching the documentary, that was one of the main things that they pointed out of the people that died on the ground. The overwhelming majority of them were vaporized yeah. uh, because of the, yeah. the impact of the plane. The and that's, fuel, yeah. Yeah, and that just goes back to telling you, you're just in the house getting some tea Chilling. or get, you know what I'm saying? Yep. And mm -hmm. I guess, um, I have to, you know, I want to kind of empathize with the woman that was describing that scene, basically saying she was like, the only good thing that came out of it is probably that those people died, you know, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's not a lot of, you know, solace that, Hey, it didn't hurt that you long. never knew what hit them. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to probably butcher this name. I apologize. Peter Gishik, Gishek lived in Park Place in the Rosebank area of Lockerbie, a quiet neighborhood of neat former council houses arranged around play parks on the eastern edge of town. The 35-year-old's three children were in bed when just after 7 p.m. he heard a deep rumbling sound. From his front window, he saw a bright light fall from the sky and explode on the ground close to nearby Sherwood Crescent. 
Within moments, there was a huge crash at the back door. The lights went out and the family were in darkness. The children had come downstairs. They were screaming. There was glass and debris all over the place, he says. I got a torch, which is, I guess, a flashlight back over there, and I shone the torch outside. There was a strong smell of aviation fuel and debris was scattered across this garden. But worse than that, there were bodies. There were bodies over my hedge. They were laying outside the front windows. They were all over the place. Forever in his mind is the girl lying on his garden hedge. I shall always remember that girl. She was wearing a blue top and a sweater. He remembers, the, oh, I'm sorry. The remains of more than 60 people were eventually removed from this small corner of the town. So here's a quick story um, I read, and I didn't put it in here, but I remember it after reading everything is, well, maybe we discuss it a little bit later, but the, the family did eventually come to him and um, of, the little, of the girl that he found lying on his garden hedge. And now they're actually really good friends. And he gave them rocks from the garden, from right where she was laying. And, you know, can you imagine, like, what that must feel like? But good God, that's horrible. <laughs> yeah. So details of the crash, the cockpit and the forward section of the plane, along with the crew and passengers inside, fell 31,000 feet to the ground. It landed in a field near Tundergarth Church, two and a half miles east of Lockerbie. The rest of the 747 went into a steep gliding dive from 31,000 feet to 19,000 feet. By now, almost directly above Lockerbie, the entire wing section broke off. The wings and the fuel tanks dropped down in a straight line, landing on Sherwood Crescent, close to the home of Fur Friar Creek. Fry oh, gotcha. There was no period. Okay. Friar Keegan's. More than 1,500 tons of material was blown into the air, leaving a crater 143 feet long. The back of the plane, which contained most of the flight's passengers, fell on Rosebank, the area around Peter Geshecki's family home. Just over the fence from Peter's garden, houses in Rosebank Crescent bore the brunt of the crash. A huge slice was taken out of the side of one home, exposing bedrooms to the open air. George Stobbs was a police inspector at Lockerbie. A former miner, he was a rural, bo rur rural bobby <laughs> just a few years. You need to, like, say that five times fast. Yeah, just a few bobby. years away from rural bobby, just a few years <laughs> away from retirement. That night, his wife heard the explosion from their home in Loch Mebin. Oh, please forgive me, people in England or Scotland, both, actually. P please forgive me, all people, for my butchering <laughs> of words. Four miles to the west of Lockerbie. When he learned the plane had crashed, he went straight back on duty. George was keen to understand the scale of the devastation. I went to Rosebank, and there was this part of the fuselage which was buried in the garden. It had clipped the side of a house he says, and there was a lot of people still inside. No bodies had been removed by that time. Eventually, they took 60 people out of that part of the plane. From there, he went to Tundergarth, where the nose cone was lying in a field, but it's with its windows still intact, and from one angle, the wreckage looked not too bad. But obviously, when he went round to the other side of the aircraft, it was just miles of wires and people oh, strapped in seats. It was a gruesome mess inside. Just a few hours after the explosion, Josephine Donaldson and her husband, Robert, went back into their house. There was a rumor that looters were already in the area, and they wanted to make sure that their home in Carlisle Road was secure. The town was full of fires, debris, ambulances, firefighters, and police. The area around their house was cleared amid fears a nearby petrol station would catch fire. The Donaldsons crept home along the fields behind their home. Once inside, Josephine looked out into her garden and spotted a handbag lying on the ground. I opened it up, and there was this girl's 21st birthday card, she says. Her name was Nicole Bollinger, and she had been 21 on the 28th of October that year. When she switched the news on, Josephine saw Nicole's mother waiting at the airport in New York. I just felt so bad, so sad, she says. She was there to meet her daughter at the airport and then discovered that the Pan Am 103 had blown up, and I just felt how strange having her daughter's handbag. 
And that's when I decided right away I would look after that girl and always put a flower down at the memorial garden for her. Nicole Bollinger was a talented singer, dancer, and musician. She was studying for a degree in musical theater, and her coming of age had coincided with the trip of a lifetime. Nicole celebrated her 21st birthday in London, where she was one of 35 students from New York State's Syracuse University who had just completed a term studying in the capital. Aftermath in Lockerbie. Thursday, 22nd of December, 1988, was the first day of a changed Lockerbie. Across the town, across Scotland, across the world, the scale of the tragedy was becoming clear. Rescue workers and media flooded in. In the surrounding hills, police and rescue teams were finding and tagging the bodies of the victims. They brought them back to the makeshift mount mortuaries, which were set up in Lockerbie Town Hall and later the local ice rink. Meanwhile, David and Steven Flanagan, whose parents and sister were killed in Sherwood Crescent the previous night, vis visited Marjorie R McQueen at her home. Steven, 14, witnessed the plane crash from a neighbor's home. His 19-year-old brother had been living in Blackpool. She didn't know what to say to them for a while. They sat in silence. And then David said to me, can I show you something? And I said, yeah, sure. And he took me out to the car and he opened the trunk and he took out a tiny watering can, something that you pick up in Woolworths for 50 cents. And he said, that's all I can find of my family. And I think it was then that we just realized just how awful this was. And that's something I will never, ever forget, never. Despite the horror of the crash, Friar Keegan's was keep to keep Christmas as normal as possible for the children of Lockerbie. The Christmas lights remain lit, but he told his bishop he would only be able to say one short prayer during midnight mass. Well, I managed to get about 10 words in, and then I lost it. I just cracked up. Uh, speaking of cracked up, sorry to break our <laughs> rhythm here. I don't know if you can hear the screaming no. two-year-old, but um, no. she just made a surprise appearance while Christy was talking, and she also knows the word podcast, and mm. she wants to do a podcast with me right mm -hmm. now. So... <laughs> Back to business now that she's gone. Many of the town residents were keen to help the families of the bereaved. A group of local women set up a laundry to sort, wash, and iron clothes recovered from the wreckage. They matched them to their owners, packed them up, and sent them to the victims as families. Can you imagine? No. Josephine Donaldson, who found Nicole Bollinger's handbag in her garden, was among the volunteers. Some of the boxes the police would give you, you just did it on autopilot. Others, you maybe had a wee look through, she says. And this particular day, it was a portfolio I was interested in. And obviously, because she was one of the students, she had all these lovely photographs. And inside her portfolio was her 21st birthday cards. And she had the same birthday as Nicole Bollinger. Uh, okay. She'd celebrated her, her birthday on the 28th October. Her name was Amy Beth Shapiro. So I always referred to the two, these two girls as my two girls. During the weeks that followed the bombing, relatives of the Pan Am passengers arrived in Lockerbie. They sought comfort and answers about the deaths of their loved ones. Peter Gusecki learned that the girl whose body he found in his back garden was Anne Lindsay Odenasek. The 21-year-old social worker, social work student was a native of Baltimore and one of the 35 Syracuse students. Sometime later, her parents came to Peter's front door. He recalls that the student's mother said, I believe my daughter was found in your garden. Peter showed her exactly where he found the body, and they talked about it all night. We actually went out for tea that night, and they were very, very nice people, he says. And we still keep in contact at Christmas time and send cards and flowers. An unfinished story. Twelve years after Pan Am 103 fell on Lockerbie, Libyan intelligence agent Abdul Basid Al Magrahi was convicted of mass murder. Good the job, Yardley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I almost <laughs> missed when when Moni was gonna finish because I was like, how the fuck do I say this? And anyway, you the did trial good. took place <laughs> in a Scottish court specifically set up at Camp Zeist in the Netherlands. He was sentenced in 2001 to 27 years in a Scottish prison, but was released on compassionate grounds eight years later after being diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer. He died in 2012, but the story did not die with him. Doubts about the safety 
of his conviction and the part played by the CIA in gathering evidence against McGrahi persists to this day. McGrahi's family is currently making a third attempt to appeal against his conviction. The Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission is now considering whether there are grounds to refer his case to the appeal court. There is no one view on this in Lockerbie. For Pete Geitschke, um, McGrahi was guilty all the way, and he was against his early release. But he does not think McGrahi was a sole murderer. It hasn't come completely out, and I don't think it will. We'll never get to the root of it. I don't think so. McGrahi was the main man, but there's other men out there as well. Today, Lockerbie is a neat, handsome town, which appears to be doing rather well. It stands besides the motorway, linking Glasgow and Carlisle, and it's the market town for the surrounding farms. Home to 4,000 residents, it was never a remote, isolated village, but it never expected to be the center of global terrorism and tragedy. It was... Ch it has changed a lot in the three decades, with new factories and housing estates contributing to a slight population increase. Where families were wiped out, lives cut short, and homes destroyed, there are memorials. But there is also new life. In Sherwood Crescent, the epicenter of the devastation, houses have been rebuilt alongside a modest stone of remembrance. To the west of the town is... Sorry, guys. Dry Fesdale Cemetery, I hope that's correct, where a visitor center tells the story of Pan Am 103 in the Lockerbie Air Disaster Memorial stands in silent testimony to the 20, 270 dead. The other lasting memorial is the scholarship, which every year gives two students from Lockerbie Academy the chance to study at Syracuse University. Okay, that's the piece that makes me tear up. That's really awesome. The university's motto is look back, act forward. It could speak for the whole town and all those lives were, all those whose lives were touched by the murders. Marjorie McQueen says the scholarship proves that good can come out of terrible tragedy. I'm very proud to say that I live in Lockerbie and that the town reacted the way it did. I think in a way when something like this happens, it's a terrible tragedy, it's dreadful, but if you wait long enough, good comes out of it. And anyone who comes to Lockerbie, I'm very pleased to say that they are met and are shown around. And Lockerbie will never, never forget their relatives and how they died here. Josephine Donaldson is a typical of the people in Lockerbie, Lockerbie, proud of the way they came together, but reluctant to take credit for their part she played. Twice a year, she visits the memorial in a small act of rem remembrance for Nicole and Amy Elizabeth two young women she never met but still refer to as my girls. I always put the flowers on there for their birthday and the 21st of December. I never told anyone, I never signed the card, I just put JD. I just felt I had to do it. I had a son and if that had happened in America and I never got him home, I would have hoped someone would have done the same. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's it. What a, that's Lockerbie. What a, yeah, uh, but I that's definitely it. encourage uh, anybody who can see this documentary. I think that um, I think we should go ahead and just post that on the um, on the Creeping and Real Facebook definitely. page. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that I get to. You. If y'all hated our um, reading our little synopsis of what happened, trust me, you watch that documentary. Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna suck you in. And I definitely agree with Moni though, because by the time you get to the end and they start talking about the people who were getting caught for it, you're like, really, like. Five minutes before the ending, yeah, <laughs> you start getting yep. into that. So, yeah, that was definitely a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's mind. something. If y'all are interested um, in this topic, definitely look more into kind of the the why. Not that there's ever a good reason, but kind of the motive and the investigation that went on with actually trying to find the people that did this. Yeah. Um, I had already started that uh, series that I told you about, so I it, it, by then I kind of had the answers, <laughs> so it didn't like hit me that yeah you guys would watch this and be like, what the fuck happened? Who are these people? You know, I it didn't really that didn't bother me because I had already started to watch the other documentary, but it, they are both of those. Uh, My brother's bomber, I guess, is what it's called, and then yes, the locker. Lockerbie bombing are wonderful um, documentaries to watch. They really are. They will, like Yardley said, 
from the beginning. They will suck you in. They are worth the time um, to watch them and learn a little bit about what happened here. So, for sure. Anybody else have any other comments about Lockerbie? Or are we graciously ready to put this to bed? <laughs> I was going to say, that's such a fun oh, act yeah. to follow. You know? let's, uh, let's put it to bed yes. and talk about the fictional stories that we'll talk Woo. about you know, on the next podcast. Okay, um, Yardley, are, what you got? Are y'all ready? I'm ready. Well, on, on January the 25th, um, the kingdom, which is the, the mm-hmm. Korean... Oh, you've been uh, waiting for that, yeah. yeah the, the Korean zombie fantasy horror thriller um, that takes place back in the... Oh, gosh, I don't even have my notes from those weeks ago. I think uh, 13th century. Well, anyway, a a long time ago in Korea during um, certain dynasties uh, that were going on. But this is like a horror thriller that's going to have some... Did y'all even watch the trailers? Because I remember before, y'all didn't even watch it. You mean to tell me, like, two weeks later, neither of you even watched the trailer for that movie? (laughs) I'm like, yeah. Well, anyway, you're gonna have to tell you. <laughs> you're gonna have to check it out because Woo-hoo! that's what we're talking about on the next <laughs> podcast. Well, it premieres on the 25th of January on Netflix. Okay. It seems to be pretty interesting. So, you know, I-, I would feel like you know maybe we'll watch, you know, a couple of episodes and just kind of give our thoughts on you know what we saw initially. Now, granted, everybody knows that Netflix releases all of their stuff um, at once, but I think that we could probably get a pretty decent gauge of what we think about the story and the effects and all of those things and probably watch, you know, maybe a couple of episodes. So, and, Are we um, also going to start your newly proposed feature, They Better, oh, They yeah. Damn Well Should, or They Better Fucking Not? Are we doing that? <laughs> we should have done you know, that with Gremlins 3. No, we're going to do, we're, we're going to do that with movies. Oh, because, okay. you know, the only reason, um, actually on Behind the Iron Throne, this is a Game of Thrones podcast that I'm, yeah. um, you know, that I'm on, norm, you know, whenever Game of Thrones is on, and for Game of Thrones, we actually had our 200 our 200 episode podcast this nice. past Sunday, and um, we did it, you know, talking about the upcoming season of Game of Thrones, seeing as you know, this kind of you know things are coming to a close, so it was it was something that we could do in the case of the story was coming to a close, but we're definitely going to do it with the movies. I can't wait till we play it before the It movie, because <laughs> I, I I've, I've got a everybody knows what different thoughts on that. But anyway, I figured we'd do something fun. So if any of our listeners, I'm pretty sure every listener except y'all, um, have probably seen a trailer for that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> It seems to be, Not shaming at all. It seems, it seems like uh, this is something that a lot of people are excited about. However, I know that there's a lot of people out there who don't like to read subtitles, so there's going to be some people who might not even like it because of that. But if you're not afraid to, to read subtitles, um, you'll probably be excited, especially if you enjoy Train to Busan. All right, nice. then. I mean, yeah. I, I can handle subtitles uh, if it's good enough. So let's hope it's good enough. I'm excited because I get worth my the amount of work that my I'm, eyeballs. Are doing. I'm still waiting for Overlord to come out. So maybe this will soothe my itch for that and give me something even better. I, I would, if The Walking Dead was better, but it, you know because of subtitles, I would probably enjoy. It. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can save The Walking it. Dead, though. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that this is going to be okay. I mean, I figure at worst it should have some pretty cool eye candy. You, you know what I mean? So uh, I, I'm all about it, and um, hopefully it's a great series. And you know what? If we enjoy what we see in the first couple of episodes, uh, maybe we'll take time to review the rest of it uh, once we've all had opportunity to go through it. Speaking of eye candy, really quick, did you guys hear that the Vikings was canceled? Or Vikings was canceled? I call it the Vikings, but... It canceled it, and I'm very angry. Sorry, I just had to share that. I did oh. not know that. I stopped watching that show after, I think it was season two. Whatever what? season it was, whatever season it was when Ragnar's son, I think they went to France and they were invading. Yeah. And they were climbing that wall, and yeah. then his son got shot through both lungs with two arrows. <laughs> and then, does. then that motherfucker survived. I was like, fuck this show. You He's know what a I mean? Viking. Okay. I'm the only one mourning it then, I guess, because I am. I never watched the season episode. Alive on the fucking show? Huh? 
Is that Floki guy still alive on the show? Hell yeah, he's the best. You can't get rid of him. Oh, okay, so, okay. Well, the cool. crazy one. I have no yeah. idea. I mean, I mean, was, he was, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a cool character. And there were also some some other decisions, too, about people kept getting chances in the first and the second season. And you're <laughs> like, why in the fuck are y'all, you know? But a lot of people do like that show. But, hey, I'm surprised it lasted this long. I like I like LaGertha, or however you say her name. Um, the You know, his ex-wife or his wife, whatever. You know, he ended up taking a couple of wives. But the main, main bitch that ends up, like, remarrying and then taking his ass Not the $1,500 a month pussy, but the main pussy? No, she's freaking awesome, man. She does not play. (laughs) I love her. I only watch it because I love her. She's badass. So, if you're looking for a really strong, badass bitch, watch Vikings. And even though it's ending now, you can still enjoy it and it's all glory. And then Peaky Blinders. Anybody watch that? Am I the only one that watches that? Anyway. Bueller? Bueller? Yeah, no. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Everyone's weird. Everyone's watching it. I don't know if that counts. I like weird shit. I'm still watching uh, Game of Thrones, trying to, you know, I, I, I'm I binge watching it again. I'm and starting over. It's so, yeah, it's so fun that's to what I did. Yeah. knowing what happens to these characters. It's crazy uh, to look so. at the brilliance of this writing because we have to remember this came from books. And every book is, like, when you look at what happens later and all the foreshadowing from the, the earlier is I, wow, I just bow down to that brilliance. That's Yeah, amazing. everything they say is foreshadowing. It's everything crazy. they say, I'm like, oh, that's a hint of things to come. It is. Well, I actually, I actually started enjoying it more once it moved past the books, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, it, it got they tighter. They got brutal. Yeah, yeah, they started getting yeah. hardcore. Yeah. Everybody was on the same page. And, yeah. and also, you have to think that the, you know... The TV shows from the source material, but they've taken their liberties to be able to put the, you know, put it in a format for TV. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. there's a lot of things that people like from the books that aren't in the TV show, but the TV show has had, had to take their liberties. And of course, you know, once they move past the books, but I do think that Dan and um, the D and D kind of um, they have a great vision and they have an opportunity. I think they're writing like a trilogy of Star Wars movies. Now, granted. They're not working with HBO. They're working with Disney now. So I, you know, I, I kind of don't want to get too hyped for what's oh. going to go on with that. But you're right, Chrissy. Very confident uh, people. And uh, congratulations on going back and watching everything because I Ooh. can't do it. And I do a damn podcast on yeah. the show. I just felt like I don't remember the beginning of it. So I'm like, mm-hmm. if I'm really, truly going to appreciate the end, even though it has nothing to do with the books. I mean, it, the books got us to where we are, so I'm going to pay homage and do it. I am now where, um, what's his name? And I can't even remember his goddamn name. That's, I'm still watching the show, and I can't even get their name straight. Tywin? Tyrell? Yeah. Which one? Mm-hmm. The little guy. Wait. Peter. Uh, Peter Drinkin. Tyrion. Tyrion. Thank you. Ty- uh. He just killed his dad, Tywin. <laughs> And now he's on his way to see uh, Khaleesi. So that is so that is so funny. I was just talking to people the other day because everybody wants to say that Tyrion is um, is so honorable, and I always have to remind people. I was like, he's got two cold blooded murders uh, under his belt. He ain't, yeah. you know, he's his mistress he's not... and his dad. <laughs> You know, but what's funny about it is that's one of the genius things that you're saying about the source material is the fact that George R. R. Martin has a great knack for making the people you like do the exact same thing sometimes of the people you don't like, but you tend to ignore it because it's a character that you like. But they're doing the same crap as the characters that you hate, and that's pretty dope. Now, isn't there a rumor, or has this been proven in the books, that he is actually related? to Jon Snow. I hear, I keep hearing that. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's fan. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> Hell if I know what, so a lot of that shit ends up happening and I'm like, where did I hear that? That that actually is but true? trust me, Game of Thrones, there's been a theory, people, I mean, Moni knows, like, mm-hmm. People pull theories out of every little thing, and, but, yeah. and, and you know most of them, you know, turn out not to be true. But right. there is a lot of evidence for other theories that are actually based off of content that people have kind of plucked out of the book. So, but all of that went out the window about a season and a half, two seasons yep. ago. 
Bye-bye. Now it's just a free for all of shit. I like uh, it. I I'm like it too. Be over so I can just move on. I'm cool with it. When I when I saw hey. Khaleesi and Jon Snow doing it, I was like, yeah, this is gonna be solid. Spoilers. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Having sex with a vamp. Get it, no. girl. You get hey, you she's some. Hot. He's hot, and it's he back then, so hot. it's not like they weren't inbreeding anyway. Whatever. I, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that Egret was probably better. Well, yeah, she's a wildling. Yes. Well, yeah. Wild by trade, wild by nature. Oh, all right. So she taught him how to be a man, so there's that. <laughs> that she, she how to know he knows nothing. That's what I was... I was like, was I imagining things? Did she really say, you know nothing, Jon Snow, when she died? And sure enough, because she just died, she sure damn yeah. did. She's like, she went out <laughs> roasting his ass. You know nothing, yeah. yeah. Jon Snow. They're married for real life, so. They yeah, are. Yeah, they are. That, and I That's think it's fantastic bitch. because he roasted her. Like, he um, he took his head, his um, set head or something, something, mm-hmm. some head, and put it in a jar and put it in the refrigerator. And there's some video; oh, it's God. hysterical of her getting up in the morning and opening the refrigerator. Oh, and that's there's right. This head oh, that in her sad. refrigerator yeah. screaming. I would have killed him, killed. But she's still married his ass, so he must True. be doing something right. So if you guys I ever wonder what we dorks talk about off the air, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Or vaginal rejuvenation, which yeah. you really didn't have or, to be thank God partaking you have to hear in, about the thermi the <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. I ended up Googling that. You're killing me. Yeah. Oh, so. my God. Hey, <laughs> hey you the asked. The guy with the, the nutty back pain. That is the, that's what that's you <laughs> should have titled it. Nutty back pain? The nutty protein shakes. Oh, my uh. God. No more nutty. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> I don't like nuts. So, I mean, I like nuts, but not eating nuts. I mean, I don't hey, know. Everybody. I'll stop talking. I'll stop I'm talking. Like everybody, everybody <laughs> get the in the ocean. handles before we, we forget like we did really? last week. All right. Uh, Yardley, then you start. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at militant underscore marker. Moni? I am Rebel Moni, M-O-N-Y, hearkening from the Billy Idol song, made famous by Billy Idol, first recorded by Tony James. My only point is I'm going to meet Billy Idol in a couple weeks. I have a meet and greet planned. So if you ever forget my handle, it's Rebel, as in Rebel Yell, Moni, M-O-N-Y. I am already putting aside bail money for you from when you, like, (laughs) latch yourself onto him and then you have to go to jail for... Never let go. I know. I know. But Uh, it's going to be good. (laughs) I am on Instagram a lot and Twitter some, and you already know Facebook is the Creepin' It Real Show. Uh, Instagram is Creepin' It, Christy, Christy's with a K. Uh, Twitter is at Creepin' underscore it, or you can just search the Creepin' It Real Show. Um, with that, you guys, thank you so much for getting through this brutal topic. Um <laughs> Y'all always make it fun, though, so I appreciate that. And with that, y'all just creep it real. Creep it real, y'all.